uh, in the yogic lore, it is estimated Shiva or Adi Yogi existed as a person, he walked this land somewhere between sixty to seventy-five thousand years ago. When I sp first spoke this, all the more sensible people around me who are not as naive as me, they're wiser people, younger people, they said, Sadhguru, if you say seventy-five thousand, they will blast you. The only archaeological proof that is there that Adi Yogi or Shiva existed is about twelve thousand six hundred years. You should say twelve thousand six hundred or thirteen thousand or fourteen thousand. I said, okay, fifteen thousand <laughs> But actually in the yogic lore, there is a clear aspect of they're talking about celestial arrangements. These celestial arrangements, if you go by the modern astronomy, they existed only somewhere between sixty to eighty thousand years in that span. There is no two ways about it, the things that he's talking about. And uh, now, off uh, the Cambe, what's, the, what's it called? In, uh, what is the Indian name for that, I'm sorry? Kambart. Ah, Kambart, is it? Yeah. Off the Gulf of Kambart, now they've done explorations. They actually went there to clean up the plastic. <coughs> but then they found a city which is five square miles. And now international archaeologists from… especially from Germany and France, they have dated this according to carbon dating uh, process that it is a minimum of thirty-two thousand years. Thirty-two thousand years ago, nowhere on this planet did a city exist. Not just a city did not exist, the idea of a city did not exist. But they had a city which is five square miles in size, properly, orderly, way of doing things, it's been buried, they're estimating it was… it has gone underwater for about nine thousand years. And similarly, of course, everybody has heard about Dwaraka. There are… there are excavations which unfortunately now is the line of control between India and Pakistan, you can't touch it. If you dig, <laughs> something else will happen, you'll hit the mines <laughs> So, there is enough proof today, archaeological proof to say over thirty thousand years ago, there was a civilized society here. Maybe not across the country, but in pockets it existed. So, this dating goes back like this. So, I am just saying over fifteen thousand years, so that when I travel west also, I look sensible. Okay, fifteen thousand, all right. <laughs> Seventy-five thousand, they'll resist because their idea of the world is only three thousand years old. They said everything happened in six days and it's only three thousand years old. Anything beyond three… three thousand years is not scientific. This has been the approach, unfortunately. Now slowly they're correcting themselves without looking stupid, but it's utterly stupid. For all these centuries you insisted it's only three thousand years, now you're slowly extending it because science comes and says something else. You will watch it in the next fifty years, science will ca come and say… modern science will come and say many things which we have been talking for thousands of years. So, Sadhguru, Einstein said that uh, time doesn't exist, but we seem to… somehow we are stuck in it. And, and you say that space took a, a cyclic turn and that's how the… the we, are, we are stuck in time. Uh, is it only our bodies or our mind? What… what I mean, how, how is it exactly See, like… right now everybody is sitting here. Let's say we will make them sit here for next ten days, just like this. Will they sit? No. Let's say we make them sit here for next three hours. Well, the body will keep time. If you forget also, suppose they're very interested in what we are saying and uh, they forgot time mentally, the bladder will keep time <laughs> It will tell you when it's three hours for sure, isn't it? Your stomach will keep time, it will tell you when you're hungry and when it's time. So once you're… once you're embodied as a physical being, time is an essential factor of your life. And you know in your experience, time is a relative experience, but in your body it is not so. It is keeping time all the time because body is just a product of this planet and it keeps time. Right now, what is your idea of time? Planet spins like this, it's one day. Moon goes around, that's one month. Planet goes around the sun, that's one year. 
all our ideas of time is only because of the cyclical movement of physical nature. This is the nature of physicality. Physicality is always happening in cyclical movements. Whether it's an atom or the cosmos, everything is in cyclical movements. Without this cyclical movement, there is no physical existence. This is what we refer to in the yogic culture as samsara. Samsara means something that is going in cyclical movement. That means it is traversing the same path again and again, but makes you believe it is new all the time. So if you have a very short memory, you will see every time it comes, you experience it as new and you're excited about it. But if you have a very long vision of things, then you see the same thing is happening. The moment you see the same thing is happening, you will want to change it, isn't it? It is from this context, the idea of mukti or liberation comes up because you see that you're stuck in the cycles of samsara, so the same thing is going round. Why is this happening? Because of our identity with… identity with physical nature, because we are so identified with the physical self that we are, now everything that we do also goes in cycles. Cycles means we are going round and round. You know, in English the term, if I say you're going round and round, it means you're not getting anywhere. So sa the word samsara has been misinterpreted and gone to into use in variety of ways. For example, in Tamil, if you say samsara, it means wife. She keeps you going round and round <laughs> I don't know how that usage came, but uh, today in Tamil language, if somebody says, uh, my samsaram, you were supposed to understand it's his wife, not his cyclical nature <laughs> Okay, Sadhguru, now my question is that, do you think like… like you said, in the scheme of thing and like in going round and round in this… in this cosmos, be like… Somebody like me, I sometimes feel that the things that I want to f do and the things that I feel for, is, is it pompous us, for of us to, to think that we can do something for others or, or uh, maybe, you know, like the spirit of… Y y if you want to do something for others, please be pompous, as pompous as you want, please do something because a lot needs to be done in this country <laughs> Okay. Um, okay, fine. Okay, so my… my… Uh, almost second last question. That's, that's good, isn't it? I'm telling you to be pompous. Okay, fine. I love being pompous anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Sadhguru, um, I, I personally have um, read a lot of books about spirituality and I've been following Swami Vivekanand from the age of 17 and I never really felt the need of a guru um, until I was faced with mortality. I lost a friend at, at the age of 25 and um, and since then, I, I just feel that everything that I've done in my life or every situation I've been into and I've walked into, I've always held my head very high and I've always been prepared for it, I mean, as much I could. Um, and I just, I can't wrap my head around it. And when I read your book, I didn't instantly feel that I would be seeing this day. And I felt, okay, fine, I've read Buddha, I've read, like, you know, you're one of those enlightened people, yeah, sure. So. <laughs> No, I wasn't impressed, let me tell you. But then I read... <laughs> but then I read um, More Than a Life, and there is the mention of this yogi, uh, Swami Nirmalananda, who waited for you all his life, and, um, and, and apparently you were supposed to guide him to Mahasamadhi. Now, Mahasamadhi is something that I've only heard of in stories and in myths and all of that, like where you willingly walk out of your body because you think that's the best thing to do at that point of time. Um, now that seems too fantastic and um, I mean looking at how our societies that euthanasia has been being legal now and the kind of resistance like when your wife heard about the process she showed extreme desire to adapt to that and she acquired Maha Samadhi in the middle of like thousands of people. It's written elaborately uh, in the book and Nirmalananda was opposed by the, the government, you know, he was not allowed to be able to take Maha Samadhi. The liberals. Yeah, because apparently <laughs> they were like, you, you can't take Maha Samadhi and so, so, I mean, don't you think like we as people, we have stopped to discuss death because shouldn't we be prepared for that day? And when I got to know that you uh, can, I mean, I mean, since then I realized maybe you can help me if some dinner, I'm not saying now, but someday. <laughs> but when the time comes, don't you think I should be ready for it? I should be dressed like this and be like, hey, come, let's go. What do you mean come? Who, who has to come with you? Like whoever! 
whoever comes at that point of time. <laughs> so. Uh, why, why is it pushed under the carpet? Why don't we talk it's about depth? Under the carpet, it's just that. That's why I said, all of us, we may call ourselves Indian, but our minds largely have become Western because our education is like that. And we, you, you just, you, you do one thing in Mumbai, you go and just look at people below their knees. You will see at least forty-five percent of the people are wearing only blue denims, okay? I'm not against it. I lived in it at one time for almost seven years, eight years. I wore nothing else but blue denims. It was like a philosophy, not just a clothing. So today that number has increased in a big way. It's American working… workman's clothes. It's spread around the world. And because workmen wore clothes which were… because of work, it wore out, you know? Our pants would wear out riding motorcycles, it would wear out, we would put a leather patch and this and that. But now people are buying pants which are torn, all right? <laughs> Paying more for the tear, you also <laughs> So, <laughs> why I'm saying this is, because of this, this imposition is not small, it's taken a huge footprint in everybody's mind. In this culture, we talked about samadhi. It's a very commonly used word, but unfortunately people think samadhi means uh, uh, it's a gravestone. No, samadhi means sama and di. Sama means equanimous, di means buddhi. If your buddhi or your intellect becomes equanimous, when we say equanimity we need to understand this. The reason why you're using your intellect so extensively is because you've been tra trained to discriminate between this and this, between everything and everything. And we create… intellect is the thing which creates division between everything. For us to function physically in this world, I must know here which is me and which is you. I must know here what is a chair and what is a floor, otherwise I won't know how to operate. So for practical purposes life, essentially for our survival, intellect is of paramount importance, no question about that. But this discriminatory dimension, if I ask you, I, I will leave her alone, okay? I will ask you, suppose there is a choice between having a sharp intellect and a dull or blunt intellect, what is your choice? You must choose, I'm going to bless you right now <laughs> Sharp. So essentially, intellect is a cutting instrument. It's a knife. The sharper it is, the better it is. It cuts everything. Why is cutting important? See, what is the nature of science that we learn today? If you went to a biology class, for sure, if you did not cut a frog or a cockroach, at least a flower you opened up. If you open up this flower, you will understand so many things about the structure of the flower, how it functions, everything, but you will not experience the flower because by the time you're done with it, it's finished. So if I want to know you, I think I must dissect you. I've come with my scalpel. <laughs> you think by dissecting you, I will know you? By including you, I will know you. By embracing you, I may know you. But by dissecting you, I will not know you, isn't it? So when in… when you… the only instrument you have is a knife and with that you try to do everything, I must tell you this. That was a time when I crisscrossed India on my motorcycle. It seems uh, where is uh, uh, Burman Irani, is he here? They're bringing back Java once again into the country, I believe. Well, I rode probably the SD motorcycles like nobody. I was doing around fifty-five to sixty thousand kilometers every calendar year, just riding across the country without purpose <laughs> Uh, so at that time I was… I don't know whether I was in Madhya Pradesh or I was in UP, the whole night I've been riding. Early morning I come to a place and uh, I want to have some tea and rest for some time. Then, uh, you know, I always fix my motorcycle on the street by myself, but the… I thought I saw a garage. It was named uh, handwritten Mubarak Mechanical Works. I looked at Mubarak Mechanical Works and whole night I've been riding, I didn't want to dirty my hands now. It was a simple thing, I had to just tighten the chain, just take off one link and tighten the chain, that's all I had to do. I thought this guy can do it. So this young, uh, very enthusiastic mechanic came out and I said, uh, why don't you just take off one link and tighten my 
motorcycle chain. Then he came out, then I saw the only two tools that he had in his hand was a chisel and a hammer. Then I said, wait. Then I walked into his little shack of a mechanic shop and looked inside, there was no other tools, only one hammer and one chisel, with this he does everything. <laughs> Once he works on your machine, nobody else can work on it anymore, it's finished <laughs> I said, okay, Mubarak <laughs> you don't touch my motorcycle like this. So right now, a whole humanity has become like this. The only in instrument they have is a knife. With this knife they cut, it's an efficient tool for cutting. Now you want to stitch your clothes, you stitch with a knife. This is what has happened to the denims <laughs> If you do everything with a knife, everything will be in tatters and it's horrible, isn't it? That's all that's happening to us. We are trying to handle everything with one dimension of intelligence that we call as intellect. There are other dimensions of intelligence within us which is completely unexplored. So samadhi means to get your intellect to a state of equanimity so that it does not interfere in your perception of what really is the nature of existence. Right now, the only thing that's interfering in your life is your thought process, isn't it so? If I ask you to sit and meditate right now, you think somebody next to you is going to poke you? No, they are fine. It's your own mind, isn't it? People say they're depressed, people say they're agitated, somebody is manic, somebody is angry, somebody is miserable. No, 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 all this is not happening. The only thing that's happening is your intelligence is turned against you. You're not getting it. You think you're suffering because of something. No, your intelligence is turned against you and nothing else. You have a knife and you don't know how to handle it. If you have a knife and you don't know how to handle it, you'll cut yourself up. Do you need any assistance from outside to make yourself miserable? You're very efficient, aren't you? <laughs> you and you told him the techniques. And when he was about to get there, apparently the government yes. got involved and in like, you cannot do that. In 1996, he announced, I'm 74. I'm happy for that, but why die before 25? Suicide is not uh, a pleasant thing. <laughs> not at all a pleasant thing, because for a human being to make… see, when somebody dies, commits suicide, we're just thinking, okay, he committed suicide. It's not like that. You must look at what psychologically that person goes through to come to the decision. It's the most horrible part of one's life where somewhere they feel so trapped either by physical situations, financial situations or emotional situations, so absolutely trapped when there is no other way. This is when they take that kind of violent exit which you call a suicide. And uh, if we… if someone tries to kill somebody, that somebody has some defense. They can fight, they can run, they can protect themselves. Some resistance is possible. But when you start hurting this one, this is the most helpless life. And it is the worst kind of torture that you can do is to torture this one because this is an absolutely helpless life with yourself, isn't it? Somebody else has some defenses. So suicide need not be seen in terms of statistics, one hour they're dying, even if one person commits suicide, it's a human concern. It must be a concern for the whole humanity, why is this happening? You must understand in this country, in 2017, 7,600 children below 15 years of age have committed suicide. Below 15 years of age, when they must be bursting with life and wanting to live, Below fifteen years of age, if they want to commit suicide, what is it? We are somewhere driving ourselves to a certain desperation. One big cause for all this is education system. Unfortunately, it's the schooling system which is killing people because if you get ninety-eight, you're no good, you know? People will ask you, where is the other two percent? <laughs> so, Apart from this, there are various other things, economic things are there, emotional things are there, various kinds of things for a human being. Essentially, simply because there is no clarity about life in some way. See, youth means it's life in making. Youth, the most significant aspect of youth is they're full of energy, it's a huge amount of energy. When I say energy, after all our life is a combination of a certain amount of energy and a certain amount of time isn't it? 
time is ticking away for all of us at the same pace, it's going away. If you sit here, it goes away, if you stand, it goes away, if you run, it goes away, if you don't do anything, it goes away, if you sleep also, it goes away. Time is rolling for all of us, it's only energy we can manage. If you organize our energies in a certain way, what somebody does in hundred years, you could do in ten years. It is just organization of one's energies. So youth means an exuberant energy. But most of the time the problem with the youth is they don't have the necessary clarity nor balance. If only, if you could bring ten percent more clarity and ten percent more balance in their life than the way they are right now, this energy would translate into something fantastic. Because this is one thing we need to do because as a nation, we are talking about our demographic dividend, where fifty percent of our population is below thirty years of age, which is a unique situation. And it's a fantastic situation only if we give the necessary clarity and balance and competence to our youth. Otherwise, we can be a major disaster. Uh, such a large youthful population without necessary clarity, without competence, without balance, they could be the biggest disaster on the planet. But if we organize this well, we could be the greatest miracle in the world. So we are making this effort and I'm putting one full month of my time traveling across the country, speaking in various universities and causing a buzz about this among the youth, speaking a very youthful language. You will see a very different Sadhguru I know, you can, I because know, I will uh, dress differently, speak differently, do everything differently with them yeah. because I'm very youthful. Yeah. So, so my, uh, my message to all the youth who are going to participate it, uh, in this, you can ask uh, Sadhguru all kind of questions why uh, about monthly cycles, about sex, drugs, all the scandalous I questions they which… Know, they know all those things. No, they don't. <laughs> Sadhguru, they, they are being a victim of drug overdose. There are so many, uh, you know, drugs has become a big epidemic, uh, especially in schools and colleges. So, so guys, I, uh, I look forward to those conversations and ask exciting questions. Okay, this is so. being uh, pitched as uh, youth and truth, unplug with Sadhguru, ask whatever you want. Ask whatever Nothing you want. Nothing is a taboo. Yeah. So how much time do we have for questions? Please. Namaskaram Sadhguru, I would like to bow down with all my knowledge and all, all sorry, my it's ignorance. Not clear to you. If you can hold the microphone, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's quite safe, you can hold it close to you. <laughs> okay. Is this okay? Yeah. So, first of all, I like to bow down with all my knowledge and all my ignorance. Like, I can't tell you how much you mean Come to, to me. Question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, my question is very simple. Uh, Whenever I go to mo watch a movie, I'm given a place and I can see the screen in front of me, hear the voice coming from somewhere and I can understand where I am. But when it comes to my life, uh, I don't know where I see things, where I hear things. Every night when I go off to sleep, I don't know where I vanish, where I come back from. Uh, something within me, seeing me pass by, all that experiences that I have, I have in my life, I've been seeing it but I can't figure out where I am. No, she's definitely not asking me. I have the same question in my life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is the last question we answer. Yes. So, when we say we have patterns, this is what we said in a certain way. They made a calculation and said, in twenty-eight thousand years, the moon will go so far that its impact on the planet will become minimal. 